Right. So welcome to Cospring Harbor. Um, so uh, I've been here, I think, almost three years uh, at Cospring Harbor. And before I tell more, so I was born in India in a very small town. That's me, that's my mom a uh, few years ago. Uh, <laughs> and then we moved. So my dad had this job. He worked for a bank, and we moved from place to place. And basically, from Belur, after we spent some time over there, this is south of India. And I moved to Delhi, where I did most of my schooling uh, in Delhi. So after that schooling time, uh, I moved to Bangalore, again, uh, back in the state of Karnataka, uh, where I did my bachelor's degrees and my master's. Then I worked briefly for a year in a biotech company before coming to Missouri. So I did my PhD in University of Missouri, along with my wife. And this is one of the football games that we used to go. And this is back in the day, days when I had a lot of hair. <laughs> and um, not great, right? Um, so after that, I went to San Diego to the Salk Institute uh, for my postdoctoral training. So I spent uh, five years in San Diego in the Salk Institute that overlooks the Pacific Ocean. It's a beautiful campus. After that, I came to Cold Spring Harbor, which is on Atlantic Ocean. It's another beautiful uh, campus. All right, with this, uh, my brief background. So today, I'm going to talk a lot about how plants can see their environment, OK? This is what we're interested in. But before that, I'll briefly mention how can they uh, smell or taste, OK? So when I say plants can taste, what I mean is plants know uh, whether to avoid if unfavorable conditions, right? So as you know that, sometimes you get flooding or hurricanes. The salt water can get into, like Hurricane Sandy. I don't know if many people remember. I was not here. But when Hurricane Sandy happened, so you get all this salt water from the oceans or sea coming to the land, and basically plants do not like salt. As you can see in this example here, uh, you have this agar plates where this is the lab rat, Arabidopsis, that we use. And this is the control experiment. And you got this increase in table salt, sodium chloride. And basically, the plant roots, before they touch this barrier, or basically this gradient of salt, they start avoiding. So the roots start growing away from the salt layer. This is like a time course done over hours. And so basically, plants can taste, OK? Not the same way as we can taste, OK? But plants do taste. So basically, they can say, hey, I like to avoid this, or I like to uh, go for this. So what I like, they really like is water. They like to go towards wherever there's a water source. OK, plants can smell. So there are plants that germinate only after they smell smoke, OK? Or if they can detect uh, smoke. And good example is, is uh, in Mount Diablo. Actually, I was a postdoc in San Diego. Uh, this is closer, close to the Bay Area. There was this uh, fire, wildfire, in Mount Diablo. And these plants basically germinated after 50 years. Okay? The seeds are made, and they get buried in the ground. And they will never germinate till it can smell smoke or you know, detect smoke. So basically, you need to have a wildfire, a carbon, uh, has to be burned before the seeds can say, hey, and, and they start uh, germinating. And we can mimic this in the lab. You just take the seeds, burn a piece of paper, expose that burnt uh, or a smoke from the burnt paper to the seeds, and they start germinating, right? So example is uh, golden eardrops. They were not seen for 50 years, right? And they will not germinate no matter what you do. So this is my example of plants can actually smell. Plants can sense gravity. We have mutants in Medicago. It's another lab model system. This is, as you know, roots go down, shoots go up. And we have mutants. Basically, they have no idea where uh, the ground is or the gravity vector. It cannot uh, sense gravity. Basically, the roots are growing all over the place. And I like to talk about this because uh, we cannot exist without plants, OK? But the plants can exist without us, right? So every aspect, the oxygen that we breathe, it's made by plants, right? The fossil fuels are basically dead uh, plants that got buried, coal or petroleum, right? Uh, that basically they made it for us. That's possible. And 
Again, um, they make our food, right? By the process of photosynthesis. And basically, so I think this is very important um, that we appreciate plants around us. Now, something fundamentally different between plants and animals is, at least when I was born, I, I was born with five fingers on each hand, right? But the plants keep, can keep making body parts as required, on demand, okay? So that's why if you go outside, or in this example, as you can see, this is an apple uh, grow, you, you'll never find two plants or two trees alike. The reason is the plants can continuously make new parts, parts in the sense leaves, flowers, branches, based on the environment, right? And what something plants, every plant requires is light to grow because that's the source of energy for the plant. So a area that receives very poor sunlight, the plants are not going to make branches towards that area. So they basically uh, figured out how to harness uh, solar or sunlight. Now, what we do is we don't study the process of photosynthesis that I'm sure all of you know very well. So what we understand is how does light tell a plant what time of the year it is, uh, when to flower, when to grow, when not to grow. And you'll be surprised that the, actually the light that you see tells what season it is. So this is the Kulspring Harbor campus seen from the other side of the sound. This is in fall, you get fall colors. How do plants know the fall has arrived? And how, for example, in uh, spring, like now, how, especially the tulips exactly know when to bloom. Uh, that is in uh, spring, how do they know? Basically, these are all the light cues that feeds in. Uh, as you can imagine, in, during spring, the days are getting longer and longer, and temperature is getting warmer, right? So plants are able to interpret all these cues, okay? and do this. And how do plants see? So plants can see by number of proteins, of photoreceptors, basically they scan the light spectrum. So phytochromes can see red light, they're involved in germination, zytlupas, they keep track of the clock in plants. Cryptochrome is the only class of proteins that's in you, me, and the plants, and some uh, fungi. Uh, phototropins is involved in phototropism. I'm sure you know about phototropism. Plants bend towards light source, and plants can make their own sunscreen, okay? Through this photoreceptor, it senses UV light, okay? So if you go out, we can put a sunscreen, but the plants can't do that. They're stuck in one place, right, outside. They cannot move. So basically, uh, the geography is their destiny. Wherever the seed has germinated, the plant grows. So the UVB receptor can sense sun's UV light and say, hey, it's time to make more sunscreen for the plant to protect its DNA, right? So because DNA is precious, as uh, Lloyd mentioned earlier, right? Otherwise, you can have mutation, can lead to all kinds of cancer in humans, so it's very, very uh, precious. Now, a little bit more about cryptochrome. So my lab mostly focuses on cryptochrome. How does cryptochrome helps the plant see its environment, right? So cryptochrome is in you and me, so if you ever get a jet lag, I tell this all the time, blame it on this protein, okay? If you ever get a jet lag, because it tells you what time of the day it is, when to sleep, when to feel hungry, etc. So this protein helps the plant see. It tells where the blue light is coming from, because this uh, photoreceptor can sense only blue light and if you knock it out, basically if the gene is not functioning properly, the plants do not know when to flower. Basically this is Arabidopsis that flowers within 30 days, and this takes almost 60 days to flower, twice the time. And apart from that, it's also involved in a lot of other processes. And in animals like us, the main role uh, is to keep track of our clock. So, and this discovery led to a Nobel Prize two years ago. And now the same protein, you might have heard that birds navigate long distances, they migrate, and they keep track of Earth's magnetic field, right? That's how they mag uh, migrate. Turns out the same protein helps the birds and the butterflies. You know, there are some butterflies like monarch butterflies that migrate long distances. So this protein helps the birds and the butterflies navigate Earth's uh, magnetic field. So it, I think it's very cool, right? Um, 
Now, something else my lab studies is a process called, or a phenomenon called shade avoidance, okay? You might have seen this if you do a bit of gardening. If you start crowding a lot of plants together, as this is an example of tomato plants, the plants uh, keeps growing longer and longer, higher the density that you grow. The reason is plants need sunlight, okay? I mean, they might seem harmless, but they're extremely competitive in nature. So higher the density, they grow taller. The idea is if you grow taller, you can capture more sunlight, okay? At the expense of your neighbors. So the reason is they keep growing taller uh, and they can tell, hey, I'm getting shaded, okay? And this shade, they can discriminate a shade that is casted by a cloud or by a building, et cetera. And this is a big problem on our food security because as you can see, a shaded plant uh, gives out less produce, okay? So for example, the radish. The reason is not much energy is available for the plant to put it uh, into, uh, into storage organs like grains or radish that we depend on to eat, okay? So this is one of the biggest problems and we're trying to understand what the problem is before we can solve it, right? So you can imagine this is one of the biggest factors that could slow down food production. So the idea will be if we can figure out the problem, can we grow more and more crops in a given area, right? And you know, the population is just increasing and the amount of uh, agricultural land is uh, decreasing. Now another problem in collaboration with a colleague at Salk Institute, what we like to do is also to understand how over the course of billions of years, how did the plants master in capturing sunlight, okay? So if you look at, this is called phyllotaxy. Phyllotaxy is the arrangement of leaves, okay? So if you have time, just go outside, you might see there are beautiful patterns how the leaves are put. The idea is if you have two leaves on top of each other, the bottom leaf is going to get shaded by the leaf on the top, right? So why do you want a plant to do that? So it will try to put it in different angles or different arrangements in very fixed mathematical uh, distances or geographical distances so that you can maximize light capture and you're not getting shaded by each other. And we're trying to understand, if we can understand how plants do that so beautifully and elegantly, we could solve this solar panel problem. You know. Uh, if you look at the conventional solar panel problem is they have to be separated uh, quite far away because the shadow casted by one panel cannot fall on the other. If it falls, you lose output by 54%. A small amount of shade of 9% is enough to reduce the output, right? So you can imagine um, we can have a solar panel tree uh, trying to, so basically this is biomimicry, right? Trying to learn what the biology or the nature has done, right? So this is uh, one area we're interested in. And with this, nothing, I mean, I do all the talking, but actually uh, I'm very proud of my group who do a lot of hard work and extremely talented people. Uh, so I got two high school students, Annabella and Michael, um, and I got two grad students, uh, Olya here, and Richard is not here in the picture, and uh, postdocs, Jenny, uh, Subu and uh, Louis. And I need to thank my funding source and uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>